at your iPod Bloom lovelies, where we're Team Wiggly in the countryside, sat on the sofa. Secretly, it's last week, so I'm with Neville from the Heritage Nature Trust, and I'm with John Harding, our genius photographer, and my co-host today is... Richard. A bit of rural rough. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> and I'm Heather. So we have to skip through the news because we want to talk to Neville and John some more. Yeah. We've got a bit of feedback. Firstly, really sad news on Frankie's blue tip. It's a bit depressing, wasn't it? Yeah, do you want to read it out? And well, I'll cry. Well, yeah, no, I mean, in pity. fact, uh, Frank is, the, uh, we, you know, I went round to give it to do a little chat and look at the garden, but ultimately to talk through their bird cam box. And uh, at the time, there was a pair of blue tits. They were just completing the building of their, the nest inside the box. And the female tit did manage to lay about 10 eggs. Yeah, so. and from my point of view, it was great because Frankie's got a blog, Allotment 21. They're based in Hereford. That's unusual in itself, never. You can probably imagine a person having a blog in Hereford. Yeah. Yeah. Fairly unusual. Yeah. Not only that, they've got their blue tits that they've made a video of yeah. and sharing uh, it with the whole world. Yeah, it was brilliant. Top couple. And, and um, it's, it's such a shame. It, it seems that the female has, uh, has not come back to the nest for no. 24 hours and the male has been up and calling for her, constantly calling, but she's, she's disappeared. So Frankie seems to think that perhaps she's been taken by a sparrow hawk or the uh, White Horse Road version of Noah. <laughs> Or, Moggy. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, we don't, we don't know. And it's, it's a real downer. It's nature's way, but it's unfortunate because we were hoping to you know, do some recordings and whatnot, which, you know, of the chicks and the chicks being fed. And Any the... chance of them surviving for another couple of days? How long does it take? I think if the female has gone for that length of time at this period, yeah. it's unlikely she'll come back. But there is a point, interestingly enough, that we talked about in last week's episode. Um, we were talking about buzzards. You mentioned there are lots and lots of buzzards and the problems that might occur as a consequence yeah. of too, you know, increasing buzzard populations. Now, if we're controlling certain species by culling, grey squirrels, deer and whatnot, then could we also control species of raptor? Now, I know, for instance, bullfinches, fantastic, beautiful little bird. They were making a comeback a few years ago. They were doing quite well. Coincidentally, at the same sort of time, sparrowhawk numbers were increasing. Now, bullfinches are really easy targets for sparrowhawks. Mm. And n- now, bullfinch numbers are dropping again. And there is a school of thought, with plenty of reason, that sparrowhawks are, you know, are, are affecting bullfinch numbers. So We'll ask Neville and John about that later. Yeah. Yeah. And just on that bullfinch point, I'd just like to say that mm. I know an organic farmer not so many years ago who had to cull bullfinches because they were actually eating his apples. Which well, my dad was very put out yeah, about. You see, there was a, there was a situation in Herefordshire, obviously a, a, in a big orchard county, uh, and I know even after bullfinches had some protection, you know, legal protection, they were still being shot by some orchard owners because they they're they quite got destructive a license. on the blossoms. They yeah. got a license yeah. to do it, Rich. Yeah. So it was all above the right, law, but right. I don't think that's a good idea. Grand, isn't it? Anyway, more feedback. In the calf post mortem, you know, we said there was a deadly silence. Right. Get it? Uh, we have a <laughs> comment from Fiona. Yeah. I've just listened to your latest podcast. I thought I'd feed back on the calf post mortem last week. I thought it was a superb article and almost got in touch to say so straight after listening. Keep up the excellent podcasts. And that's Fiona in Northumberland. Yeah, thanks for that. And we have Mike Hibbert who says, Hello, Wiggly team. He's not from America. Right. Uh, Where's he from then? I don't know. <laughs> he says, he says, firstly, love the podcast. Really enjoyed Farmer Phil's post mortem. I found it fascinating. I normally listen to the cast at work, so imagine their shock when I said, they're cutting a cow open. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And he's got a hedgerow question, um, which we can probably bring in Neville on as well. Mm. And he says this We have a beech hedge at the front of our house. It's planted about 20 inches apart, but only single row. Now, for about 10 of the 12 months, it looks rubbish, and it's so patchy that you could drive a John Deere through it. Actually, I imagine you could drive a John Deere through most hedges, but anyway, this is he says that, not me. Our first idea was a wall, but it's not environmentally friendly, and a hedge would be nicer, but we have no real idea about what would look good for as long as possible. Current favourite is a laurel hedge, but when would we need to plant it? And more importantly, how good is it for wildlife? What's your thoughts? Shall I go over to Neville first? You could. I mean, Neville, will, uh, I'm, I'm sure, will have a, a pretty comprehensive knowledge of native species that are probably more appropriate to use than, than laurel. I mean, having said that, laurel, you know, it, it's an evergreen. It provides some cover for, you know, hibernating inverts. 
Well, um, shall I go over but, to uh, Neville uh, first? I, I think. Oh, OK. <laughs> no, you can't go into Neville okay. first. OK, I'll go to Richard first. <laughs> go to first. Neville now. <laughs> Neville, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, Richard's right. It's um, aesthetically pleasing, Laurel. It's nice for your garden, but it really doesn't support much wildlife at all. It is an evergreen and might provide some cover, some roosting cover in the winter, but that's about it. Obviously, from my perspective, a good wildlife hedge would be the best thing. So uh, a native species hedge? Nat- preferably native species, things like hawthorn, blackthorn, gelder rose, hazel, spindle. And the other good thing about all those species, not only do they provide food, shelter and a home for certain wildlife, but you've got the blossom in the springtime, all the blackthorn. What a fantastic Beautiful year it's been. Oh, it's it has for blackthorn. This year. Absolutely fabulous. Yeah. Hawthorn coming out. You've got the berries in the autumn and when you've got, you know, spindle flowers and berries are just amazing. Can we expect Pink. a lot more slows this year, given that the blossom has been so good on if, blackthorn? Potentially, yes, yeah. indeed. But that's the thing. You've got the colour, you've got the vibrancy, you've got all the different shades of, of leaf. Yes, they're not evergreen, but you just got to wait till the they? spring when they the change. blossom comes out. Yeah. And they're still providing place for wildlife even in the, in the winter. Hedgehogs in the bottom and small mammals, foals and mice and things. So, you know, that's the best thing for this garden, I, I think. think he's right. Oh, totally. John, yeah. you, you must have experience of this because you must want to get birds feeding yes. at the moment. Can you see the, the benefits well, of the blossoming? I think if the right plants and shrubs are planted, that mm. will attract wildlife without doubt. And if you've got a rowan at the right time of the year, you can be almost sure that you're, and you want to take photographs of birds, you'll certainly get uh, missile thrush, sun thrush, blackbird feeding on the rowan berries. During waxwing year, of course, they also very much like the the, uh, the rowan, but also the gelder rose, which you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, that's a favourite. So I think, again, if, from a photographer's point of view, if you've got access to shrubs that have the right sort of fruit, you can almost guarantee that you're going to get a very good chance to take some photographs of the species that like those berries. Bet your garden's a corker, isn't it? Well, in, in fact, I only take very few photographs of my own garden. There's a, a few cats around, so I don't sort of encourage them too much. Poor the old birds. Moggies get another slamming <laughs> on birds, the Wiggly um, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> they have to live. But I, I have <laughs> various locations. <laughs> I don't think they do. <laughs> I disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> on the subject of birds nesting, I'll just show you all this. I'll have to paint a picture. You can see these pictures on my blog, wigglywigglers.blogspot.com. And they're from Mike Hallam in Derbyshire. Hmm. And Rich, perhaps you could describe it. Paint, paint a picture. Well, yeah. what we've got is we've got this fantastic, perfectly formed little robin's nest full of mosses and dry leaves and various animal hair. And inside there are these tiny little fluffy balls, little brown fluffy balls, and they're baby robins, aren't they? But the most amazing thing is, is this robin has nested on a bag of worm treat. <laughs> well, in a bag of worm <laughs> treat. In a bag of worm treat on the, on the guy's shed, which is uh, <laughs> just a typical robin thing to do, really. I'll pass these over to John and Neville. So that's the alternative use for worm treat. So get your roll up, roll up, get your worm treat from Wiggly Wigglers. Yeah, Makes yeah. the perfect nesting area for, for robins. For robins. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I was telling you this morning that, uh, that when I, I went to get some, I was doing some brickwork over the weekend and I went to get some hessian from the top shed. And I walked in there and it was a bit dark and whatnot and I went to pull it a bit of hessian and a little robin took off and flew out and landed just on the edge of the shed. I thought, oh, where's he come from? And I, was, and I looked round and what I'd done is I put a bunch of insulation, this special insulation that you staple onto studs called Tri-ISO Super 9, really warm stuff, you know? And the little robin had nested in the Tri-ISO Super 9. <laughs> so he's got this great little tent over his nest. And of course, but I can't use the hessian now because there's a, a robin on top of it. But they do pick the most unusual places to nest. Yeah. But that's a great photograph for our catalogue. Any it? old teapots, put them in your head. Absolutely, yeah. We've got um, Martin Walker from Hull who's made a pond. Yeah, good photos, Martin. So he's, he's given us a photograph of a guy in shorts with a fleece on. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably Martin. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. He's got his bother boots on and uh, he's digging a cracking little pond in a garden which looks to be ideal for wildlife. There's a, there's a huge diversity of, of plant life. It's slightly unkempt, got his wormery in the background. And then uh, as a follow-up, he's got the pond all completed. So it'll be interesting to see what his pond looks like in 12 months' time. Fantastic. And lastly, um, before we have a chat with Neville and John, uh, we're in the news this week. We have wormery being trialled by 
Amateur Gardening, the editor, which is Lucy Hulsell. She gives it a real good thumbs up. In fact, it's almost a milker. Yeah. Um, we're in Gardener's World, and they talk all about composting. Really good article. You're going to take that Brilliant home. Brilliant article, yeah. Um, with a can of worms in it. And then lastly, Gardening Witch, where they've tested all sorts of composting additives. I was quite surprised <coughs> at this because biotile doesn't come out very well. And cardboard and newspaper doesn't come out brilliant, and we know from experience that that is a really good additive. It does, it does work. I think they haven't cut it up as finely as they could. No, um, I think that too. I think that's a slight... Sand and soil comes out well, but the winner is complete rot for grass, so it's straw-based material, and you add it about one to six by weight. Right. So that's, in real terms, a fairly small amount of complete rot to a fairly large amount of grass clippings. Yeah. Particularly good if you've just got grass, but the best way of composting, have a full mix of material. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. We've got Monty coming up later, but just now we're back to John and Neville. Last week we stopped right in the middle of our conversation with Neville and with John, so we will rejoin it with John posing a question. Neville, I would like to ask you um, how you see the problem uh, where in biodiversity plans there are so many agencies involved. It could be a county council, it could be Wildlife Trust and others. And there comes to uh, many cases where a particular group will support a particular species and another group the habitat that it lives in. For example, perhaps someone wants to change the habitat because that's their particular interest, but it's against the wishes of those protecting perhaps the mammal that lives in it. And it seems to me there's no overall decision maker, and this sometimes produces conflict. (laughs) Well, to an extent, but I, I can understand, yeah, there's often contradictions, but that's the great thing about the biodiversity action planning process. Every county has gone through this biodiversity action planning process and that's a collective process. Actually, all the bodies you've mentioned, all the the statutory nature conservation bodies such as English Nature and the local district and county councils, the wildlife trusts and the interest bodies, the amphibian groups, the bird groups, have actually collectively got together. Neville, any farmers? I would undoubtedly, yes. And the RSP... um, I can't say exactly how many farmers. NFU? Probably not to the extent that there should have been, put it that way. But I don't know. But I would assume not to the extent there should have been. But what we've done collectively as a nation is actually prioritise what are our most important habitats and species, yeah? Where they are and what level they're at. And what needs to be done in terms of action, and that's the action part of action plans, what needs to be done to say whether the they're there in suitable numbers, what we need to do, increase their numbers, what do we need to do in terms of their habitat management to make sure they flourish. And that process has been a, a quite a dynamic process and it has involved lots of partners. So that's, that's the positive thing, you see. And out of that, we've got biodiversity action plans, both for habitats and species. And that basically is leading the way, not only in the county, but regionally and nationally. There's a Herefordshire BAP, as we call it, the acronym. There's a, a regional BAP now for the West Midlands, yeah. so that's focusing on what's important in terms of habitats in the region. And there's, there's national BAPs, and that's, that's come from the experts, you see. Now, from the outside, it might look like we're all tugging in different directions, and, but it does come down to prioritising. On a certain site, it might be important, you know, be it, be it a site of special scientific interest <coughs> in SSSI, some of our nature reserves are SSSIs, they're of national importance because they contain a specific habitat or support certain species. And that's why they're designated and that's why they have that statutory protection. But it's been prioritised because of that, because of the scarcity or the rarity of that habitat or species. So that becomes where we put all our resources to try and manage it. We need to understand what condition it's in, what we need to do to manage it to bring it into tip-top condition or what level that species is at. But if it's dormice, you want to know what population there are in that wood. What factors are stopping that dormice population from expanding or from just proliferating within that woodland? And we are working together. I've got to say, we are working together. But like any organisations that are either, you know, have difficulty in funding or other resources or manpower, we often sometimes tug in opposite directions. But we do have that... Overall. BAP process that brings us back in. These action plans are reviewed 
to see whether we're achieving the targets and that might be a surveying or monitoring target. We need to know what we've got before we can say how we're going to manage it or it might be an actual target to restore 100 hectares of wet grassland in the county. So in the case of Herefordshire, yeah. the, the plans were made, the objectives were set. Yeah. Are those the results of those objectives reviewed annually? And if so, are they published on a website or in a document form? We actually started the Herefordshire about five years ago. And just last year, there was a review, a five-year review. Yes. There was a, a, a BAP officer that was based at the Trust, employed by the, the partnership, the network, the, you know, English Nature put in money, mm. Council, Hereford Council put in money, all funding <coughs> this one officer. They were based at our, our offices at Lower House Farm. And they did a whole review amongst all the partner organisations, and that included Herefordshire Ornithological Group and Heart, which is the Herefordshire Amphibian and Reptile Team, all these local interest groups that you know, have volunteers and members looking at those specific interests. We all got together and reviewed where, what we'd achieved in terms of restoration of habitats or just even maintaining what we've got. And also in terms of understanding, you know, we don't know where all our native crayfish are, which rivers are in, what population levels are at. There's tons of work to do there, but we do review them at the most optimum time when, you know, given resources and things. So, so this review, it is kind of coordinated. That's what the back process is all about. And we're all singing from that same hymn So you sheet. would say it, it's been a success so far? It has been a success, but like anything, we're restricted by resources, aren't we? You know? Funding is, is a problem. Wouldn't it be better putting all that money and all that time and all that energy and all that effort into just having a training programme for countrymen? Wouldn't it be better just have a change attitude and encompass people instead of just Absolutely. going around having these little pockets of, of wonderfulness? Why don't you put all the money in, encourage all the farmers all the people to come and chat and get the idea of things and then it would all be fine because you wouldn't have to do all this going round in circles and having these voluntary body meeting things that means that nothing much happens for tons of years. And Oh, things are happening. Don't get the wrong picture. No, I think it's huge amounts of work and, and achievements are made. Training. Trying to get, people, get, Training get farmers level. together collectively. You know, what venue? How do you attract them? Um, it is. It's critical that we communicate, that we talk about things. We, we learn from each other's Isn't experience. Isn't it also critical that you listen? Indeed. Because if you haven't That's got, the, the, NFU, if you haven't got the NFU at the meeting, <laughs> you're not going to get farmers on board, are you? If you haven't invited them, how is it going to work? Well, I think possibly NFU were involved on a national level anyway. You, you're right. You, the thrust of your argument is... The wider countryside out there, outside of nature, is, is the key for conservation for the future, and it is. And I think that's the challenge we've got. We need to all strive towards a common goal. How we get there, coming together and talking, which is what you're advocating here, is the first step, isn't it? It's understanding other people and what other people's views are and what they see. But getting to that point is not easy. For us as a small charity, we've got to apply for a grant to set up a project with the aims of doing that. And yeah. to get to that point, a lot of effort has to go in. And we've got to prioritise what we do. Great concept, and it is what we need to do for the future. And, it, you know, it's something the Wildlife Trust do take on board. Speaking to our neighbours, learning from our neighbours. You know, we do it on, a, on an individual nature reserve basis. We involve our local farmers as graziers on our sites. We talk to them. We know how it's been managed. We try and accommodate their needs in our management. We tweak our management. So it fits in with their livestock needs or their, their farming needs. So, you know, we do communi communicate on that level. So we do have ca those linkages. What we actually need is a, sort of a national conscience about all this and, and a consensus of opinion and ideas. And, and we all strive together. Because ultimately, I think most farmers would like to see more wildlife. Definitely. They've got their own ideas on what needs to be culled and, and maintained levels. But, you know... Compromises have to be made along the line. What do you reckon to that, John? Well, I think, actually, we have to involve people and people have to understand what we're trying to achieve and that has to be explained to them. And there are some very good examples in Africa of that where the villager, if he's killing a particular species, he's got to be shown that there is some benefit, perhaps, in maintaining this endangered species. And uh, there's right. a village in Africa where... The uh, locals were encouraged to go and collect the snares and uh, they taught them how to use the wire to make brooches 
and those brooches were brought to London and sold in a sale. The money from that went back to a school, and now you've got that community now sort of looking for snares and wire, and therefore that particular species now starts to survive. And I think we've got to spread that around, because there are just thousands of species just disappearing every year. The list gets longer. That's really interesting, actually, John, because that kind of links in what we're trying to do. We've got a project based on what the area called the Woolock Dome, just to the east of Hereford. Oh, Ricardo is the man, isn't he? Uh, Right by there. She actually lives there, I believe. (laughs) I do live there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know about the Woolock Dome project. Yeah striving to work with landowners that still have good habitats that support wildlife and trying to break down the barriers that prevent them from managing. That might just be providing fencing, might be linking their site to a grazier. But one of the the key things coming out this year, actually, that we've got funding for, is an enterprise project, which is actually employing somebody to look at how we can increase the value of the produce that comes out of these habitats. You know, we've got orchards there. Now we're farming. Exactly, fantastic. Local habitats, important in the county and in the region, Mm. supporting wildlife. We've got apples there. Cider producers may no longer be buying those apples. We've got projects looking at alternative uses of, of apples in the county. But we also need to look at how do we put added value onto the apples that actually come out of Herefordshire. How do we put added value onto the meat on the livestock that's grazing these conservation sites? Mm. How do we look at charcoal that's been produced by small-scale producers in the woodlands in these areas? How do we bring them together and market them? What are the bar- And that's what we're trying to do over this coming year, is actually look at what the barriers are and try and stimulate, potentially look at how to stimulate the market and how to bring in that added benefit so people, the consumer will pay more because they know it's products coming from a wildlife site. He or, sounds like a wiggly podcast man <laughs> now. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. Here we, a question yeah. then. I mean, obviously I think Heather, and I'm a great supporter of Wigglies because I think the podcasts have explained to a lot of people what happens in the countryside, the problems. Have you taken on the idea of the trust running a podcast to make people aware of, of the projects that you've just mentioned? It's it seems to be a, an excellent idea to put your message to quite a wide audience. It's a fantastic thing. As a trust, we're evolving, <laughs> like every other organisation. And we've got a fantastic website now, but we've never investigated podcasting. And, you know, this is the first time I've ever been part of a podcast. And I've never looked at podcasts. I try to, but, you know, I don't have the technology at the moment. But, yeah, it's a great idea, and I'm quite kind of um, warming to the whole concept of podcasting. Sure. And I think it could be a great communication tool, just like the, just the web has become um, in itself. So, um, yeah, I, you know, and we relatively, might embrace it soon. Uh, a very cost-effective way of communicating. Oh, dirt cheap. <laughs> Not. <Yeah. laughs> That's right. His fees are very high, exactly. I'm sure. I, uh, factors, isn't yeah, it, really? yeah. yeah. I was just thinking, well, Hereford Nature Trust is evolving. Yeah. The farmers are revolting. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's interesting, though, uh, you go, going back to John's point a second ago, you know, the fact that we're all in this room, all, you know, we're singing, ultimately singing from the same hymn sheet, but, you know, slightly disagreeing. Well, that's a bit of an another. edge there, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, absolutely. But, of course, we get the opportunity through this podcast to talk to one another in this room mm. and other people outside of this room, several thousand of whom will also get the, the opportunity to listen to what we're saying. So, If we've um, made you mad, listener, you know what to do. Communication opportunity. The best thing to do would be to make us an audio file, an MP3 file, which you can now attach to your email and send to heather at wigglywigglers.co.uk or richard at wigglywigglers.co.uk and then you can join in that <laughs> row, otherwise email or make a comment on our blog. So, Neville, just harking back to the, the biodiversity thing, I mean, at Herefordshire, is it more biodiverse or less biodiverse than, say, five years ago? Slight marginally better, I would have said, right. than it was five years ago. We've, we've made lots of achievements. So that's, that's encouraging in itself. I mean, I, I know certain species of birds have done well and benefited from various kind of human input. Um, others are suffering not just because of the, the actions of human beings in the UK, but also because they're migratory species and uh, you know, the, the worldwide effects have an impact on their, their population densities. And one bird I'm thinking of particularly is our cuckoo. 
and that's it's one of the most fabulous sounds, isn't it? You know, yeah. you, you hear it you hear it in the springtime, and actually yeah. this year I've heard probably more cuckoo activity than last year. Well, well, that's probably just a coincidence. But I mean, what's the situation with cuckoos in Herefordshire? I wish I knew. I think cuckoos are doing relatively well because of the sort of the nature of, of our landscape. Nationally, they're not doing so great. I, I was reading an article in South Wales that they've declined enormously. So as a species, they're on the decline. They're not of con- there's no conservation alert. They're not a red list species, for example, at the moment. Right. Have you ever seen a, a young cuckoo or, a, or any of your? I've observes? seen adults, but I've never seen a fledgling or a chick in the nest at all, unfortunately. We, we had a, a situation at home when I was living just over Bishopstone a few years ago, and there was a young cuckoo in the garden there. Mm. Perfect site for cuckoos. Big open areas with lots of hedges. Lots of birds, cookies, good vantage points to, to watch the nesting birds to drop in and lay their egg. And John, this second photograph that he must be really, really proud of, brought in is a, is a cuckoo being fed by a reed warbler. What a link, <laughs> Ricardo. <laughs> this is, he I mean, this scores. is just, I think this has got to be one of the quintessential English wildlife pictures. Because, you know, as a child, you see this big fat bird being fed by a tiny little parent bird. And that's exactly what this picture is portraying. Yes, um, it, it was taken a number of years ago, that photograph. But it, it was a great privilege, but very uncomfortable while I was waiting to get that shot. I mean, the, the hide was in a mirror, and I was about four foot of water. It was, I had waders, and I managed to get the shot, and then I sort of lost my footing and went into the mirror. So <laughs> I think uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, the moral is there, you always take a change of clothing, because I went home very, very wet. <laughs> but it was great to see that little reed warbler feeding the cuckoo, and... I've been back many times since, but not managed to find another nest with yeah, a cuckoo. You're my, very my proud mom, of that photograph. My mum used to say, blooming cuckoos. You know, they take advantage of these birds, blah, blah. And you two are talking about them as if they're wonderful. I think it, it just why it, it, the safety aspect, obviously that fell in the mirror, but there's one other thing, and I think it, it all, I ought to bring it up because of Phil's cows, which I listened to with great interest. I did at one time try to film a carrion crow feeding its young. So we set up a scaffolding tower of about 30 feet, guide it very nicely, put the hide on the top, and I climbed up at the appropriate time. We always have two people when we do this sort of photography. They work on the principle the bird can't count, so two go up for the hide, one gets in, one walks away, and then that guy comes and collects you when you finish. that's clever. A couple of walkie-talkies, does the job. Anyway, I was sat in the top waiting for this shot, and Karen, because they were quite big young in the nest, and uh, therefore the adult birds were only coming very occasionally. And what I'd not noticed, that since I put the hide up, um, a herd of cows had uh, been put into this particular field. (laughs) And they um, uh, They decided to use uh, the scaffolding tower as a a rubbing post. (laughs) And suddenly the guy started to go, and I'm in the top, you know, swaying backwards and forwards. And and I I thought, you know, I was very close there to a disaster. So I think the moral is, if there are cows in the field, don't even attempt (laughs) photography. (laughs) That's yeah. a handy hint from photographer John. Is, is you were nearly um, knocked out of your own nest then. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you, uh, I mean, we've, we've got to wrap Brings this up. new we, meaning really. to out of your tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to know about taking f- photographs for real beginners from John, just while he's here. Right. A few John tips. Well, I think you don't have to have very complicated equipment to get photographs of your garden birds. You've got to conceal yourself from the bird, ideally. Use a window with the curtains drawn, but put a feeder in the position that is photographable. But don't just have them on the feeder. Maybe attach a a branch with some flowers on adjacent to the feeder. The birds will then usually alight on the branch before going to the feeder. And if you have a nice clear background, that also helps. But a car also makes a very good place to, to film from. Always take a camera with you. You never know what's going to pop up. Have you got one with you today? Yes, indeed. There we are. <laughs> Just test it. Uh, but a portable hide is also very useful if you take it a little bit more seriously. Yeah. But baiting is the answer. And definitely your mealworms are the top of the list. <laughs> oh, I paid him. And oh, I, tried, yeah, right. I tried to film a red start last year, and I was came very much success at all it was nesting in a stone wall and then i thought i'd try some wiggly mealworms which i put in a dish on the wall and within minutes of doing that uh, the bird was uh, eating we're gonna have to 
have to ban you in the middle minute, you know. We just okay. can't sell on the podcast five pound forty. <laughs> <laughs> but really, you know, if you bait the birds, uh, they will come to you. Mm-hmm. With mealworms, in fact, I've had uh, just recently, uh, which I sent you some shots of, where I didn't have a hide at all, because once they get hooked on them, they'll keep coming. I didn't need, need, need a hide, and wren, robin, all eating from, you know, five, six feet away, uh, without any hide at all. <laughs> Wonderful things. <laughs> well, we can't wrap him up on that, can we? Excellent. Thank yeah. you, John, very much. And Michael's got those shots ready for, I think, the winter catalogue. So we'll see them then. Just before you go, we'd like to invite you both, if you're available, to our big news moment, our launch of the Wiggly book called Bringing a Garden to Life, which is at Hay Literary Festival. It's the 1st of June at 2.30pm, and the day will go like this. There'll be a talk in the Café Direct to hopefully 200 people, and listener, can you come? And then it'll be followed by drinks and nibbles in our Wiggly Garden, which is in the middle of the showground. So I'd like to invite you both to come with your partners if you're available. Also, we have 10 invitations to Wiggly Podcast listeners. We'd like you to join us, if you can, to the book launch and followed by the reception at the Wiggly Garden. Right. You need to let us know if you'd like to come because we have 10 tickets only. So email Heather at Wiggly Wigglers. Do you want to talk a little bit about Hay and who's there and what we're doing, Rich? Well, uh, Hay Festival, I, I think most people, certainly most people in Herefordshire know about Hay Festival. It's the largest literary festival in the world, in actual fact. And there are lots of really interesting people, coincidentally enough, the Hay Festival this year has a real environmental bent. There are lots of different people there coming to talk about many different sort of aspects of environmental management, climate change, etc., including Al Gore. Jonathan Porritt. Rose Prince. Princess Michael Kent. Eric Lynn Sykes. Sykes, Daniel Butler, Rosie Boycott, who I think you've had experience of before. She wrote Rosie that Boy- fantastic Didn't you article Rosie last week in a podcast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she wrote that fantastic article. Simon Hoggart from the Guardian. So I mean, all sorts of really interesting people. I booked yesterday when I was up at the Hay Festival to uh, to go and see Al Gore. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what he's, he's got to say. I saw Bill Clinton there uh, three years ago or something, so it'd be nice to see his chum, his partner in crime at the Hay Festival. Um, Kathy Sykes, Professor Kathy, Kathy Sykes. Sykes. You know, she wore that nice vest on the telly and talked about interesting stuff. Nice vest on the telly. (laughs) Didn't she? (laughs) Well, fair play. I mean, it's a fantastic festival. I think we're quite quite lucky in many respects to have a festival event this year to launch our book, in effect, and show off our garden. We're doing a series of talks in the garden, aren't we? About three a day? Yeah, I think probably three a day. Various aspects of wildlife gardening. So it might be uh, natural pest control, creating habitat, pond construction, etc., etc., and we've also got two workshops at the end of the Hay Festival where we'll be working with children, making some bug boxes and looking at worms and whatnot. Oh, that's the that, weekend. That's the, yeah, that's the last weekend. I yeah. won't be there. Yeah. Now, you're doing some TV stuff, aren't you, on Saturday? Oh, what can you do? Oh, what can you do? Yeah, it's a shame, isn't it? So be, I mean, it will be really good. We've had a couple of reviews from our book, haven't we? We have. One of which has been from Joe Swift. Good relationship yeah, with Joe. Yeah, he's off BBC past. Gardener's World and he's got an Eva Solar feeder. Right, right. I wish there'll be several at the I think Garden there will. this year. Yeah. No, I don't want to give too much away. But Joe said, Bringing the Garden to Life, referring to our book, is a beautiful, inspirational, practical, and inclusive book which works on so many levels. Another point I should make about our book is that. John, who's, who's with us here today, has provided some seriously fantastic photographs. Uh, uh, we're, we're incredibly appreciative of that. Look. So, um, yeah, I think the, the photographs, they're, they're a sort of combination of the efforts of, uh, of Michael. We've got Michael's photographs. Michael. We've got Jenny Steele, who wrote the book. We have Mark Eccleston, who usually focuses on bugs and bumblebees and things like that. We have Rachel from the Wiggly team, who's got photographs. And then we've got loads of... John's fabby, dabby, birdie yeah. photo. <laughs> Are we trying to be modest? Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. but anyway, they, we all know they're fabby, dabby, so we can't some, get out of it. I mean, some stunning, know, stunning graphics. We had customers asking us to buy those photos separately. Right. <laughs> Right. Carry on. Okay, so well, we're certainly looking forward to our event, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah. 1st of June, 2 30, Cafe Direct, Hay Literary Festival, Wiggly Garden, Rock On. Few beers, or it might be champagne. Champers. Could be pims and lemonade. It could be some hair for <laughs> cider. Who knows? Something will happen in the Wiggly Garden. Pip is busy building this wonderful old rusty bandstand at this very moment in time. Over we go to Monty's Wormcast. Go for it. 
The Wiggly Wormcast podcast by Monty, a weekly fact on worms. Earthworms have lots of enemies. Snakes, birds, moles, toes and even foxes are known to eat earthworms. Beetles, centipedes, leeches, slugs and flatworms also feed on earthworms. Thank you, Monty. John, your last words on the weekly podcast. Enjoyed the morning? Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. And thanks for coming. Neville, I know you've had a bit of a coughing fit, but you're all right. Oh, uh, fine. <laughs> it's been fabulous. I really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you for being so candid and like, getting involved in the whole spirit of the thing. Yeah, Ricardo? Yeah, I, I just want to say cheers both. Thanks very much. It'd be nice to see them both again, I think. Uh, really good. Cameo at some point. I think it could be a regular spot there. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Tales from Shropshire and Herefordshire Nature Trusts. Absolutely. Anyway, thanks everyone. We'll see you at Hay Festival. Bye for now. Bye. 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 Yes, before you go, we, we have should, an uh... invite for you both. Um, <coughs> unless Neville's going to pop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was trying to hold off so I didn't Yeah, no, you do that. <coughs> it's like at the dentist and eventually you go... <coughs> <coughs> I've never done that. I bit him once. <laughs> 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 yeah, went, oh! oh, yeah, that's how we are. Take you off your list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you did actually. It was, it was the Smith and I never went back.